All right. So sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, the audio would only come in over Wi-Fi or dialed in, and I didn't have the password to dial in while I was in the colony, which is where I was going to start. Um, so I'm not sure if I can get there from here with this um, set up the way it is right now. Um, but welcome. Uh, my name is Ryan Potter. I'm the island supervisor here at Matinic um, with Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge, um, doing the seabirds for the summer. Um, I do have two others that can come join me. Um, so these are, I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Adriana. And I'm Mitchell. So uh, the three of us have been out here for the summer. Uh, we got here uh, early May, about May 10th, I think, was uh, the two of us. And then Mitchell joined us a week after, after a week on PMI. Um, but we've been out here doing the seabird research for U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, looking at the primarily the common and Arctic terns that breed here, um, as well as black guillemots, leeches, storm petrels, common eiders, and a few others um, that just happen to be on the island. Um, so like I said, it's the three of us, and so our jobs um, have been throughout the course of the season based on what the birds are doing. Um, so we've been setting up productivity plots for the terns to monitor a subset of nests for how well they're doing, how many eggs they're laying, how many of those hatch, how many of those chicks survive. Um, Guillemots, we search the rocky exterior of the island where they uh, nest under crevices. Um, do the same thing and they they will lay up to one or two eggs and so then we follow them um, later in the season uh, we've done our census count um, currently the number sits just over last year's record of about 1230 birds uh, nest that is so double that for the number of birds um, with about a 70 to 30 split um, common turn to arctic turn ratio um, we do adult turn um, reciting. So we look at trying to find Arctic turns with field readable bands um, to find lineage uh, studies um, to see how old they are or where they might have come from. Um, we have actually found a couple common turns with uh, bands as well, one or two that have come uh, that were originally banded in Argentina. Um, we're waiting back for more information on what those numbers um, give us, but that's some of the other steps that, stuff that we do. Um, we look at chick growth measures measurements, uh, how they're doing productivity wise, how they're, they're faring, as well as the fish that it's being brought back. Um, this season in particular, we've seen a lot of sand lance. Um, normally we want to see a lot of herring and hake, um, but sand lance isn't that, that bad of a fish. Um, so that's been a good sign. Um, we have had a very interesting year of weather, as I'm sure many of you back on uh, the mainland might know, but a lot of fog, a little bit of moisture. Um, which has played its effects on some of the chick survival just because they can't handle the weather as well as an adult yet um, when they're downy. And so the numbers aren't uh, too low, but they're not at their highest. Um, so we're still waiting to see, and we'll know over the next week, week and a half of basically what our final numbers might be um, as they start to fledge. We haven't had any leave yet, but we have a couple that are just getting there. I think the adults are starting to hold back on the fish. Um, to try and maybe uh, encourage them to go off on their own, but they're there. Um, we're just waiting for them to take flight. Um, our storm petrels uh, have not hatched yet. They are very late for the season, um, as is typical for them. And so they'll start hatching in the next week or two. Um, and they're all underground in burrows, so not really something you see. Um, and yeah, so for that, um, if there's any specific questions you have, um, or I can show some videos eventually later too um, that I have on my phone. Brian, could you start with just a basic overview of what a day on the island might consist of for you? Like from the time you get up to the time you're done for the day. Yeah, so typically I'm the first one up uh, at around sunrise, uh, early riser, but uh, we have a flock of resident sheep on the island. Matenix just is over 300 acres and is uh, has an inholding on the uh, southern side uh, that has a resident flock of sheep that has been here for quite some time. Um, and normally they're allowed to roam the island during the winter, but during the summer we push them back to the south side and put up a fence, but some stay on this side or make their way back. Um, and so early in the morning, it's kind of making sure they haven't come down and aren't wandering off into the turn colony, um, as well as any uh, 
falcons or raptors that might be trying to hang around and eat the uh, prey on the turns. Um, so that's just typical, like wake up, kind of make sure, you know, things are normal. Um, and then typically at seven o'clock, we do uh, a morning count. So we count all the guillemots and eiders and gulls around the uh, north point of the island, um, if weather allows us. Um, and then we go about different tasks for the day. And primarily what we do every day is productivity for the turns. Um, so we have little fenced plots that we go to and inside those plots are anywhere from eight to 12 nests. And we count how many eggs there are. And then once the chicks hatch, we have bands on them. We collect them, we weigh them, take their wing cord. And we do that every day um, for a group of them. Um, right now we've been doing a lot of provisioning. So we do three hour uh, diet watches. Um, where we sit in the bird blinds um, and count the types of fish and the size of the fish that get brought back to the nests. Um, and then throughout the day, um, it's just always keeping an eye out if there are any predators that might be around that need to be discouraged from staying in the area. Um, we do guillemots every four days, four or five days. So we'll go around the perimeter and check those nests um, and do weights and measurements for them. Um, and so, yeah, it just kind of varies each day kind of has a new task or you never know what's going to happen. Sometimes it's based on the weather. You can't really do much because it's too wet. So we get to hang out and wait until we can. Um, so yeah, each day is kind of different, but usually it's always looking at the birds. Thanks, Ryan. And I'm just going to put it out there. Anybody that has any questions. Feel free to just unmute and ask. We've got a really good opportunity here having Ryan available to chat with us. So definitely take advantage if there's anything you are wondering about with seabirds or what it's like to live on an island. Uh, what are some of the types of fish that the birds are eating? Anybody want to answer that? Types of fish? Sure. Yeah. So. The birds bring back uh, several different types of fish. They bring back herring and hake and sand lance and butterfish. So the sand lance are long skinny guys. Um, sometimes they're kind of difficult for the chicks to get down. Uh, it's kind of funny watching them. They'll have tails sticking out of their beaks while they try to eat these giant fish. Um, yeah, and the butterfish are round, also kind of hard for some of the little chicks to eat. So we find them every now and then uh, on the ground. and. Um, some other ones here and there, like pollock and mackerel and haddock. Um, sometimes they bring back other things too, like you bought these little krill things. Sometimes random stuff too, like moths and caterpillars and ants and kind of anything they can catch. So um, yeah, those are the main fish. And sometimes some other random stuff too, if you have anything you want to. Nope. Uh, the insects are typically uh, either birds that specialize in them or if the fish aren't doing too well. So sometimes you'll see a specific bird kind of bringing back that more often. It's not the best food for the chick and the chick doesn't always usually want to eat it. Um, but yeah, so typically we want herring and hake, um, but this year we've seen a lot of sand lance. Um, so yeah, it kind of varies, but that's been the predominant is probably sand lance this season. How long are you guys out on the island for? Uh, so our season runs from the first week of May in, and we're going to be here for another two weeks uh, end of July. So almost three months. Do you get a break at all? Uh, we haven't this year. Nope. <laughs> Does that bother you that you don't get to come off the island? Uh, it's okay. You know, we can we can do our own laundry here, and um, it's a pretty short season, so we get through it. We uh, get breaks with the weather. Um, when it gets foggy and wet, we can't really do much, so I guess that's what you consider a break. But um, we at least have cell service and Wi-Fi. I've been places where they don't have that. So, um, yeah, we've usually been able to see the mainland, so I guess it doesn't feel too far away. Can you talk a little bit about that, what it's like to just like living on the island, not necessarily the work that you guys are doing, but like, are you in a, in a tent? Are you, what kind of living places are you in? I will flip the camera around to show you. 
So this is a kind of a tour of the island. So there is an in-holding um, house that we, the Fish and Wildlife have recently acquired. We have compost and clothesline behind there. This is our shed, um, which has the ATV and um, that's where we shower. We hang solar shower bags up on top and then go in there for at least protection from the wind. Um, this is the house. So a nice cabin. We have obviously a barbecue. Um, it's got a kitchen, a lounge room with a wood stove, as well as um, two rooms upstairs. So it's it's relatively comfortable. We don't have running water. We do have solar electricity, which um, we do have obviously an outhouse and there's the solar panels. Um, and this is actually the colony out here. So you can see um, right there is a bird blind as well as back there. And so those are observation points that we um, will sit in and do observations from. And then that is South Cove. We obviously have a picnic table, a bench. There's our forest. So we have a nice little spruce forest. Um, and then a trail that runs along and the Gillimonts, as I said, nest along around here, um, as well as the other side of the island. And so uh, typically, I would say it's pretty comfortable for a field camp. Uh, not not necessarily the most um, remote that you can get um, in sense of being in the tent, but we do have food brought out to us about every two weeks. We have propane, we have propane stove, propane refrigerator. Um, we have a well for water so we can go collect it. We have fresh drinking water brought out as well that we have in five gallon jugs. So like I said, uh, it's pretty, Pretty comfortable for what you can consider being in. Um, but I mean, there are little things that you miss every once in a while, like a blender. What's hey, your Ryan, favorite it's Eddie. Oh. Hey, Ryan, it's Eddie. Um, I, I was just wondering with all three of you, what was your biggest aha moment or what was the biggest surprise um, living on the island this summer? You all want to jump in? Uh, so I've been doing seabirds for 12 years, uh, something like that. I actually worked with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife at Petit Manon up north two years ago. Um, so I think it's just the joy of being back out on an island, um, walking up on top of the hill in the morning as the sun rises and sunsets and just that kind of calmness uh, that, that comes with being out here. Um, it has been really cool this season because the spruce forest has a lot more songbirds. And so at the start of the season, the songbird migration, uh, Matinic falls right in line with where a lot of those songbirds migrate up north. And so I was able to get to see a lot of birds I haven't seen before. And on one of the days in particular, I stood in one spot and probably had a couple hundred birds, warblers, tanagers fly into the tree in front of me and then all leave from that tree up off the island. And so it was just, they just kept coming in and there was a new bird every, you know, every few minutes there was something new to look at, um, which was really something special. You don't really get to experience that very often. Um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, this is kind of normal for me. So it's just kind of just home, but I'll let the other two jump in. So one of the things I guess that I was really surprised about, something that surprised myself was how much I was really gonna love leeches storm petrels. So I've never ever seen a storm petrel before I came here. And they're, I think they're goofy little birds and I love them. They're uh, nocturnal and they dig burrows in the ground to nest in and they smell, they smell musky. So you can smell them usually before you can find their burrows. And they just have a really weird call and. They actually have, they nest under our house. And so sometimes we can hear them calling at night and they sound like weird giggling monkey ghosts. It's a really strange call, but they're a really, <laughs> they're a really interesting bird. And um, so that's something that surprised me. I didn't think I'd get to interact with them as much as I already have. Um, so that was a, a fun aha moment for me. Uh, I think the biggest surprise for me was just how aggressive the turns are when they're here breeding. Uh, they, uh, 
you walk into the colony in the beginning of the season and they kind of fly around to you. And then as they start laying eggs and those eggs hatch, they start getting more and more aggressive and they'll start dive bombing you. We've all gotten hit in the head quite a bit and they'll, they'll poop on you with surprising accuracy too. Uh, so it's just kind of constant harassment, but uh, after a few weeks, you really get used to it and just kind of, kind of go with it. Yep. As you can see, I think I have a couple of the stains on the hat right here. Actually, I was a little, I was a little bit surprised because you guys must have done your laundry this morning because your clothes are are fairly clean and not white, um, which I typically yeah, see when I, I visit actually, you guys. I actually did wash this jacket before uh, this morning, so it was about time. It started to smell like fish. Can you guys each talk about a little bit about your favorite species on the island that you get to interact with? Yeah, so I, my first bird when I got into seabirds was a type of tern, a grayback tern. So I think I'm partial to the Arctic terns. They're very similar. Um, they have like little stubby legs, that nice red bill. Um, compared to the common terns, the common terns are very uh, boisterous and uh, a little more aggressive. The Arctics, I mean, they'll, they'll fight back, but I feel like there's just something more uh, comical about them. And uh, they also have one of the longest migrations of any birds on the planet um, and can do over 40,000 miles in a year, going from the northern hemisphere down to the southern hemisphere around Antarctica. Um, and they'll do that yearly. Um, and so that's just kind of something that's remarkable is uh, being able to hold one of those birds or see one. We did have a couple bands that um, if they were, if we have what we have correct, the, the bird was banded in 2001 as a chick. And so that would put it as 22-ish years old. Um, which is something that's remarkable. They have older runs than that, um, but just something special to actually kind of see and obviously get to see the cycle from eggs to chicks. Um, so that's one for me um, that I think, but I'll, I think I'll let the other two jump in. I think Adriana already kind of mentioned hers uh, with storm petrels. Yeah, yep. So I jumped the gun on that one, but we just storm petrels. I've really liked so far. We haven't interacted with them as much as like the turns and the guillemots, um, they are kind of harder to get our hands on and we don't want to mess with them too much while they're still on eggs. Um, but they're just unlike any other species I've really seen or interacted with so far. Um, just a cool little bird. They're pretty much all, all, all the same color. I mean, I'm in hand. They have some white on the rump, but otherwise they're pretty much just grayish. So they're not the flashiest of species, but they've got some character and I really like it. So they've been my favorite so far. Uh, for me, it's definitely been the Gilmonts, a uh, really cool, unique seabird that I think is kind of a mix between a loon and a pigeon. It's kind of weird, uh, but specifically them as chicks. I don't know if you guys have seen pictures of them, but they are really adorable, uh, really fun to hold. And uh, we've been having to weigh them, you know, a couple times a week. So it's been really fun to see them grow and just how, how fluffy they are. They're great. Have you had any uh, rare bird sightings out there while you've been out there? Um, I don't know in terms of rare, rare. Um, we have had a uh, few birds that aren't seen as often. We had a scarlet tanager, uh, evening grosbeak. Um, these are obviously songbirds or passerines. Um, we have had some Jaegers. We had two parasitic Jaegers fly over today. Um, we have seen a few puffins and razorbills, which aren't rare, but still unique. Um, to some of us that don't get to see them here. Uh, anybody else think of anything? Black tern. We had a black tern, which he, he's apparently pretty calm and he shows up every year, but only one of them. Um, he was here for a few days. Um, we've had a few roseates pass by, unfortunately none breeding here that we are aware of. Um, we did have some American oyster catchers, um, which I know aren't too common in Maine, um, that have flown by once once that's landed on the reef. Um, so yeah. I do have a few photos and videos that I can also share my screen hopefully and uh, 
be able to show as well if there are any questions, um, just so people can get a view of the island since I can't really leave without the audio cutting out. Okay, so this is a, a little time lapse of us getting to the island. Uh, so we have a little boat. Um, I don't know if I can get that out of the way, but or that's how you get back to that. Okay. So yeah, so we have a little boat that comes out, they row us our stuff um, and we then offload it and bring it ashore. Um, obviously we're in hip boots. The rock weed was pretty thick this year. Um, that's Eddie actually rowing. Um, that is a view of what it would look like when it's nice and sunny and clear. Um, this is South Cove on the right. There's a bird blind gannet um, kind of panning across. We have a couple other bird blinds. Um, as you can see, this is when the sheep were down here before we had round them up at the beginning of the season. And there's a couple more bird blinds in the back and our house. Um, that is Alicia's storm petrel. Um, and so that is an adult. And you can see that little bump on the nose. That is a, uh, they're under the family Procelliform, which is a tube nose. And so that little, nostril type structure um, is actually one of the ways in which they excrete salt. Um, obviously when you eat uh, fish from the ocean, uh, you're gonna get salt, salt water. And so they have a special gland that helps with the excretion. As you can see, they're pretty small um, and they are pretty fun because they actually walk on the water surface, kind of dancing um, and then fishing for little crustaceans, euphosids, uh, copepods while they're doing that. Um, here is a video of some common eider ducklings and hens, um, a little crash of fluffy joy. This was taken through a pair of binoculars, so sorry if it's a little bouncy. Um, but yep, they like to hang out in the intertidal when it's low tide. Um, and we have had quite a few good numbers for them this year, so that's a good sign. That is a common turn with a leg band from Argentina. You can see the little orange flag, and so. Uh, they were prospecting and setting up, and we did have another one that uh, looked to be breeding in one of our plots. Um, so we're waiting for more, for more information, but again, they also migrate down south. Um, and so one of those long flyers. Uh, that's a typical view of this summer. Um, it's been very foggy. This is during a provisioning watch. So uh, there's the data sheet. There's our little bird blind window and uh, looking at the fish for the birds just below um, out of view. That is a guillemot chick. As you can see, that is uh, recently hatched, uh, nice and fluffy. Uh, they're all black, their inside of their mouth is red. Um, and when they are an adult, they have red feet and that is an adult. Um, so if we have chicks and the adults there, we will capture them to hopefully either read their band or put a band on them and take some measurements as well um, and send them on their way. Uh, there is a Arctic tern and an Arctic tern chick. Um, the, the adult is still brooding an egg while the little one is still begging for food, um, ideally from the other parent, um, but that is the uh, antics that typically go on while we're out here. That is a uh, pile of spotted sandpiper chicks. That is an Arctic tern recently hatched, uh, downy. Uh, you can see a little white dot on the tip of its uh, bill is its egg tooth, and that's the little tip that it uses to break out of the egg shell. Um, when we collect the turn chicks, um, I know it was recently Amazon Prime Day, so here you go. This is our version of it out here. Um, we collect them, put them in a box, and then weigh them, and then distribute them back, and this is kind of what happens. There should hopefully be some sound. They like to hang out. And we'll collect them and that's the easiest way for us to uh, make sure that we have everybody in the plot before we start weighing and measuring and putting people back. Um, and sometimes we collect fish that they've spit out and they like to re-eat it. And this is that butterfish, which as you can see is a bit wide. It's like a flying saucer. Um, and it's usually too big to go down the chick's mouth. This guy tried uh, for about a couple of minutes while we were standing there to get this one down. And then until, until we ended up taking it back because it couldn't swallow it. These are the types of fish we do not like to see. 
Um, we have not had too many this season, but on occasion, um, we have seen them come in. And again, yes, they're just too big for the chicks to swallow, sometimes even for the adults to swallow. Um, but that's usually in a poor year. Uh, another Arctic tern chick recently hatched. Here is a spotted sandpiper um, with that indicative little bounce to the behind. So we have them breeding on the island as well, and we have quite a few pairs. Um, and they've been running around the shorelines and in within the colony. Uh, there is a mostly feathered, almost fully feathered turn chick um, getting ready to leave. Again, just waiting, getting those last little bits of down off. Um, and this is, actually, I don't think that's going to be the best view. Uh, this is a video clip of this morning. Um, so these are some little chicks right there by that rock. Um, as you can see, uh, kind of hiding. There's some adults flying around. So this is a view from one of our blinds. So that was that. Yep, you're back, Ryan. Okay, I, I couldn't hear you for a second. Maybe, Are we good? Uh, Ryan, maybe could you um, touch on the importance of, of you guys actually being on the island and, and what would happen if you weren't actually living right there in the colony and um, what your prediction would be like for, for the colony? Yeah, so for many that aren't familiar, uh, some of the birds here used to nest a little bit more commonly throughout Maine uh, decades ago. And then with uh, mostly the extent of landfills, open landfills, um, goals and such, uh, started to kind of have proliferation in numbers um, and take over in areas. And so they kind of came in and pushed some of the turns out in a lot of islands. Um, part of these uh, managed island system within Maine coastal islands is uh, basically working to get that space back for the turns. And so we're here and our physical presence is kind of a deterrent for the goals to kind of want to be down here in North Point. Um, and so they do nest kind of up in the forest um, on the other side of the island, but we have kind of created a safe zone um, for the turns down here. Um, because those goals in proximity will usually uh, predate on both the turn eggs and the turn chicks, um, which obviously is not, not a good sign of success. Um, and so us just being here um, is definitely the eagles are not as keen to want to be around. Um, so we do, we, we try to make sure that we do walks um, around the uh, perimeter when they're starting to set up in the season to make sure no one nests down close. Um, and as well as looking at keeping a keen eye out for other predators such as uh, uh, peregrine falcons or merlins. And so again, it's just trying to be a physical presence that um, limits their want to stay here um, or utilize this as a primary feeding ground, kind of giving those um, turns the space and freedom to nest as they can. We also do invasive plant monitor, uh, management. Um, so the sheep primarily clean out the, uh, the field during the winter and then we move them back. Um, but other plants that could take over or not as um, suitable to ne nesting habitat for the turns, we try to, to pull um, or manage um, over the time, course of the season and uh, years to come. Um, as well. And so, yeah, just looking at the, uh, the, the data and the science and the weather and the fish patterns, you know, that gives us a, a grasp of, you know, how they're doing and how they might be looking to into the future. But um, just having a physical presence here, I don't want to say babysitting, but it kind of is that kind of concept. Um, 
we are act as little guardians to try and make sure that first and foremost they are doing well which is why we don't enter the colony when it's wet um, or for any prolonged period of time i know we said that they like to attack us um, we try to minimize um, obviously our presence and what we're how long we're out there um, and where we're at so that they are able to um, have the most time to just um, act normal or breed um, as they can and so we definitely try to keep that in mind um, so yeah they would not have a uh, real great chance if we weren't here they'd probably get quickly taken over Were there any other questions? What drew you guys to wanting to go into this line of work and living on an island during the best time of the year and sacrificing your summer for seabird conservation? Yeah, someone else just said sacrifice thing. I don't think we look at it as a sacrifice. Yeah, we wanted to come here and do this kind of stuff. So. Uh, yeah, I think we're all kind of big bird nerds at this point. I've been birding since I was nine. I've been looking to do this kind of stuff for a long time. This is what I want to do as a career. Maybe not specifically this island or seabirds, but um, bird management or conservation or just birding uh, in general. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just being part of a, a bigger project where I get to learn more about birds and handle and be around birds is something I was looking for. Um, so yeah, this sounded like a really cool place. It was new to me and never been to Maine. So I said, sign me up and I'm happy to be out here. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. It is a very unique experience to be out here and to be kind of apart from normal civilization for a few months. Um, so I think you can look at that positively and just have new experiences out here and just it's a simpler life. I will say on my own behalf, obviously I've been doing this for 12 years, but I got into this by mistake. Um, I graduated, had no experience in birds. I knew pigeons and pelicans. Uh, liked coral reefs, found a job on a 26 acre sandbar in the middle of the Pacific for seven months with four people cut off from the world entirely. So that made this look like nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, got hired because the boss uh, thought I was someone else apparently when we got there, but uh, 10 steps onto the island when I got there, uh, fell in love with the birds uh, face to face with the lace and albatross and spent the next seven months working with all sorts of types of uh, northwestern Hawaiian island seabirds, um, frigates, tropic birds, sooty terns, grayback terns, albatross, um, and just fell in love, uh, found home, you could say, found, found what I've been looking for. And so that's why I continue to come out here. Um, I don't think there's a better place to be than a seabird colony in the summer. Uh, if I were to say something, but you know, that's my opinion. Um, and it's just something special um, to be able to, to see these birds that leave in the winter and also just to see the, the intricacies of uh, the entire process from arrival, courtship, egg, hatching, and the ups and downs of good years and the bad years. Um, just really being in tune in a way that you don't really get to in society um, is something very special. So I had a, a question for Adriana. I know all of you are, are really there for the seabirds and working with seabirds, but you have a little side project going on this year with moths. And we've never done anything with moths out on the island. And, and you sure, certainly have opened my eyes to some of the work, but maybe can you just touch a little bit of the, the cataloging that you've been doing out on the island? Sure. Yeah. I was wondering when you were going to ask, Eddie. <laughs> um, yeah. So I also like moths. I got into moths a few years ago. Uh, last summer, I did a pretty simple like baseline biodiversity survey at a plant conservation preserve in Western North Carolina. And I really enjoyed that work. Um, so what I was doing was just documenting what species were there and how many they were and where they were distributed. And so I came here and I asked if I could do the same thing. And I was really fortunate that the refuge staff were very supportive of it. And they let me um, start trapping moths here. So what I'm doing is I'm pretty much just taking a five gallon bucket out with a funnel in the lid and there's a little UV light on top. I set the trap out at night and the moths are attracted to the light. Um, and the next morning I just photograph them and let them go. Um, so I've already 
documented about 87 species, uh, over 400 individuals. And one species in particular called a slender clear wing is listed as imperiled in the United States and critically imperiled in some New England states. So it's pretty neat. I'm actually getting some unique species here, um, some kind of uncommon ones, uh, and also some really cool ones like the really big Luna moths and Polyphemus moths. So some pretty cool stuff. Just seeing what's here. All right, well, we know you guys have a lot of important work to be doing out there, so we won't keep you uh, too much longer here. Uh, do just want to put out to everybody that we will be doing um, similar things with both Ship Island and Petite Manan Island coming up. So the Ship Island call is going to be Wednesday, uh, the 19th, same time, and the Petite Manan call is going to be the 22nd, the Saturday um next saturday and that will also be at 2 p.m so we hope that you can join us to talk to those crews as well um, every island is a little bit unique and a little bit different and we're looking forward to chatting with them and super excited that we have the matinic crew here today to kick us off yeah thank you for having us you have anything final you want to end off with that you didn't get to share already or Uh, we're, gonna, we're waiting to finalize what the season's going to look like. Like I said, it's not the best season, but it's definitely not uh, one of the worst. Um, we've had a lot of fun, a lot of fog. Um, and so, yeah, I made a lot of new friends in the process. Feathered ones, of, it, of course. Awesome. Well, then we'll let you guys get back to all your important work here. Thank you again for hanging out with us for the last hour here. And letting us learn a little bit more about what it's like to be a super researcher. Yep, you're welcome. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.